My name is Jonathan Darty. I'm actually one of the elders here at the church, and I am really looking forward to bringing this message this morning. Statistically speaking, 30 to 40% of the professing Christians in this room have a current ongoing struggle with pornography. And I'll try to avoid contact, eye contact here so that nobody feels like I'm calling you out right here in the front, of the, front end of the service. But don't worry, if you don't fall into that 30, 40 to 40%, this message will still apply because 100% of us have some kind of ongoing struggle with sin. But I want to be clear up front, this is not a message of shame. This is actually going to be a message of great celebration of the gospel of Jesus Christ that sets us free. The topic today is freedom. The way the world defines freedom versus how God actually defines freedom. And we've been looking in this series about the waters we swim in. It's those things in life and culture that are so deeply ingrained into our sinful nature that sometimes it's hard to even recognize, even as Christians. And then we've sought to go to God's word and say, what does he say about these things so that we may walk as faithful followers of Jesus? So real briefly, let me just give you an overview of what the difference is between what the world says freedom is and what God says freedom is. The world says freedom is being whoever you want to be. We looked at that a little bit last week when Drew was talking about identity and just saying, I can just claim whoever I want to be. But God says true freedom is being who he made you to be. The world says that freedom is doing whatever you want to do. Cast off all restraints. All boundaries are bad. God actually says true freedom is doing everything that he tells you to do. The world says that freedom is following your heart, making your own way in life. But God says that true freedom is following the way, Jesus Christ. So to set up our text today, I actually want to share with you my personal story of sexual addiction and recovery. And parents, don't worry. It's not going to be graphic, but it's going to be honest. See, it's a story of a boy who grew up in a Christian home, but eventually wandered onto the path of the world's definition of freedom, only to discover that it led straight to hell. When I was 12 years old, I had a friend of mine from school introduce me to pornography. I had no point of reference for this material. I'd never been told about it. I'd never seen it. I'd never even heard the word. So when I saw this material, it was shocking. It scared me, but it also thrilled me, and I didn't know why. And then all through junior high and high school, porn sort of became my secret drug. It was where I would go to escape. It was where I would go to deal with stress. It was where I would go when I was bored. And I was learning through those years how to live a double life. I was essentially learning how to present an image to others so that they would go, wow, what an amazing young Christian man. While all the while inside, I'm building this whole library of lust that is teaching me the ways of the world that says, you know what, true freedom is being whoever you want to be, doing whatever you want to do. Follow your heart, Jonathan. Go wherever these desires take you. When I got into college, it wasn't just about porn anymore. I then became sexual with other people. 
And the weight of this started to really become heavier and heavier on me. It wasn't as if this was a gleeful trip. I want you to understand, and I'll get to it in a minute. I've been dealing with people who are struggling with sexual addictions for over 20 years in my ministry. No one goes there happily. This was not a happy journey. This was a weighty journey. This was a journey where I'm living this double life, carrying all of this weight. And eventually I got married because I had grown up in a Christian home and I knew, well, that's the one relationship where God sanctions this kind of activity. And so I got married thinking that would cure my problem with porn and lust. If you're married, it's okay to chuckle a little bit right here. <laughs> because thinking that marriage is going to cure your sin problems is a little bit of a misnomer. It's not going to do that. In fact, I think by God's design, what marriage does, he says, I want to actually magnify and expose and show you just how selfish and sinful you are by trying to learn how to love selfless, selflessly in this relationship. So marriage wasn't the cure, and soon enough, early on in my marriage, I started hearing the siren song of the world's definition of freedom luring me back into these old ways, saying, you know, you really got married too young. You didn't have a chance to sow your wild oats. Or man, now you're stuck with the ball and chain. Hey, be your own man. Do whatever you want to do. And so I did. And little by little, I started getting back into these old ways. Pornography at first, and then the internet came out. Yes, I'm aging myself. And then chat came out, and then I started using the internet to set up hookups. And then if that didn't work, I even solicited prostitutes. It was dark. In the summer of 1999, everything came to a head. I was depressed, I was suicidal, and I eventually confessed everything to my wife, not because I was really looking to change at that moment, but because I was too lazy to write a suicide note. I'm gonna just confess all this, and by the end of the week, I'll commit suicide. And through a course of events, eventually, my wife left to protect herself from any more betrayal. It was the right move. And the day that she left was the day that I was broken. I was alone in my house. In some ways, that is the pinnacle of the world's definition of freedom. Be all to yourself. Get everything that you want. Guess what? The world's definition of freedom is actually a definition of hell. Oh yeah, you'll get everything you want and you'll find out it's miserable. And that day that my wife left was the day that it's as if God came to me and said, I want to ask you a question. He didn't come with shame. He didn't come pounding me with rules or law. He came simply by grace, saying, you know, Jonathan, you've been trying it your way. You've been trying it the world's way. You've been trying to make it all about you and think that that's going to bring you satisfaction. Are you ready to try it my way? Are you ready to fully surrender every part of your life, not just what looks good to others, but are you willing to now surrender every part of your life and see if my might keep my promises of truly setting you free? And that, as the old saying goes, was the first day of the rest of my life. And so for the last 25 plus years, I've been on this journey of recovery and growth, learning what does it mean to actually have a fully surrendered life to Jesus, that by grace, he's invited me into this place to be a completely different person, and to just kind of wrap up that part of the story before we get into our text today, by God's grace, after nine months of separation, my wife and I were actually reconciled and restored. And so we have been married over 28 years now. And God has given us the beautiful blessing of three kids who are now adults. And out of that also was birthed a ministry to help others who are struggling in this area. And that's what I've been doing for the last 20 years. And can I stand before you now and testify to you that God's way is the better way? Amen. Not just the better way. It is the best way. And I would even say, as the word says, it's the only way. If you truly want to be free, God's way is the only way. And so as part of my recovery... Romans 5 through 8, Romans chapters 5 through 8 really became the worn out pages in my Bible. 
Because this is where we are taught so clearly, what are the actual implications of this gospel message? What are the actual implications of this relationship with Jesus in terms of how it is meant to be worked out in our lives? Now, I'm not going to have time to cover you know, all four chapters, but I do want us to look at chapter six. Romans chapter six is where I want us to spend our time to see what does God say true freedom is in Christ. And we're going to find in this passage what freedom in Christ is, the effects of that freedom, and how you can actually live in that freedom, how you can have it. So open your Bibles with me to Romans chapter six, starting in verse one. Romans is in the New Testament. It's just after Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then Romans. Uh, If you don't have a Bible with you, we're going to put the passage up on the screen. Starting in verse 1, it says this. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we've died with Christ, we believe that we'll also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died to sin, for the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we're not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves to sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness." I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Feel we could just close it up right there say amen and go home and just live according to this. But I think we need to unpack it a little bit more. See, this freedom that we have been given by God in Christ, it is a freedom, a freedom from, a freedom to, and a freedom for. We're gonna unpack in this passage, what is this freedom that we have in Christ? It's freedom from, freedom to, and freedom for. First, let's take a look at freedom from. In Christ, we are set free from the penalty of sin and death. That is separation from God. Look again at these verses. Verse six and seven tell us this. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. 
For one who has died has been set free from sin. And then again, in verse 18, we're told, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. And then one last time in verse 22, we're told the same thing. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. In Christ, you are set free from sin. What does this mean? Well, because of sin, sexual or otherwise, we are all deserving of the just, righteous penalty of God, which is death. That is separation from God. But God so loved the world. But God, in his kindness and his mercy, he offers us a way to be reconciled to him, which is faith in Christ. Trusting in Christ. Simply looking to Christ and saying, I give my life to you. You're my only hope. You're my only way. Therefore, in Christ, we are free from this penalty forever. Let me try to illustrate this idea of, of death and then freedom from that penalty or that uh, consequence. Imagine you have a, a gas-powered car. Now they're becoming rarer and rarer nowadays, but let's say you have a gas-powered car. And in the gas tank of that car, it's filled to the brim with sand. What do you actually possess? You possess a dead car. Like that car is dead. Apart from some kind of outside intervention, that car will never operate as it was designed by its creator to operate. If nothing happens from the outside, that car will remain dead in its sand and transgressions, right? It's dead. The same is true with us. We are born with sand in the gas tank of our souls. We are dead, and apart from outside intervention, there is no hope for you or me to ever operate as we were intended to operate. Now, I want you to understand something on this freedom from portion. It's important to understand that there's a, there's a dividing line in this passage in Romans chapter 6. The first, cha the first half of the chapter, Paul is really trying to address, the Apostle Paul is the one who wrote this letter. The Apostle Paul here is really trying to address the eternal condition of our souls. When he says at the very beginning, what shall we say? Are we to continue in sin? That's different from the question that he asks in verse 15 when he says, what then? Are we to sin because of we're not under the law but under grace? There's a delineation here. In the first half of the chapter, he's dealing with our condition of sin. We were born with gas, or sand in the gas tank. And apart from any outside intervention, we will remain dead in, the, in our sins. But when, by the grace of God, he draws us and we place our faith in Jesus Christ, he says, sand is gone forever. There's a conditional change in our lives forever. You are set free from the penalty of your sin. There is no longer any guilt. There is no longer any shame. You are set free forever. That is the free from. We are set free from our sin Therefore, we can get to the freedom to and the freedom for. If we're never set free from, we can't be free to and we can't be free for. And so we need to understand this because a lot of what we're going to be talking about here as it relates to my story and dealing with this issue of freedom, we're talking a lot about our, our character and our conduct. But we need to recognize here at first when we're talking about being set free from sin and the penalty of it, that that is such a great truth. No matter what our ongoing struggles may be with sin, if you are in Christ, you are eternally set free from the penalty of your sin. God will never hold that against you as judgment because he says that judgment was paid for you on the cross of my son, Jesus. And that is great good news. And the effect of that freedom from sin is peace with God. We have peace. The chapter earlier, Romans 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, what is that? Trust in Jesus, right? We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God's righteous wrath against your sin and mine was paid in full through Christ on the cross. So in Christ, you have everlasting peace with God. This is something to rejoice in every day, 
even in the ongoing working out of our salvation or what does this mean to my daily life, working out what it means to walk in freedom, know that you possess freedom in Christ. You are no longer guilty before God because he has cleansed you. So godly freedom, God's definition of freedom is freedom from the penalty of sin and separation from God. But also we're shown here that there is a freedom to. In Christ, we are free to live a righteous life. Look at the text with me again. Verse four says this. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And then verse 19 says this, the last half. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. And there's another couple of verses in here, verse 12 and 13, but I want to read them in a different translation to really help you understand maybe even a little bit better of what is being said here. Verses 12 and 13 in the New Living Translation say this. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. See, you're not just set free from sin. In other words, you're not just set free from the sand in the gas tank of your life. Go back to this car example. Once the sand has been removed from the gas tank, that car is now alive, so to speak, you know? It's now able to function as it was originally designed by its creator to function. And the same is true with us. When we have been liberated from the sand of our lives, we are now free to live in the way that God designed us to live. And how do we know the way that God designed us to live? We look at Jesus. Jesus was the perfect human life. Jesus showed us exactly what it means to live as a clean, free, whole, forgiven, saved individual. Like, he was righteous, perfectly righteous. And therefore, guess what? Because we've been raised to new life in him, we now have his spirit and his power to be able to live that same life. We can live a righteous life because of Christ and because of the freedom that he's given us. You know, in my own story, when you, know, you can kind of think of the porn and the lust and all that, that was like sand in my soul. And in this process of recovery, there was, that was all being removed. And keep in mind, we're not talking about the conditional aspect here, we're talking about the character aspect at this point. These things would be removed out of my life. From an eternal perspective, I was clean before God because I trusted in Christ and he had forgiven me. But I was operating as if I still had sand in the gas tank of my, my life. And so as God was cleaning me out, as God was getting all this gunk out of my life, and by the way, it's the difference between living in the dark versus living in the light. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit in a minute. I was starting to learn that I could actually operate in the way that God designed me to operate. Rather than seeing other human beings as objects to be used, I could see them as beautiful image bearers of God that have dignity and worth. Rather than saying that I must go in the direction that all of my sexual lusts are inviting me to go to, I could say no to that and I could, I could live a righteous life instead. And that's what God does to us. That's the effect of freedom to live a righteous life is power. We are given power to live this out. You know, a little, couple chapters later in Romans 8, we're told that the same power, the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in us as his followers. You know what that means? There's absolutely no temptation, no trial, no kind of threat that you could ever be under from the enemy or sin that you do not have the power in him to conquer. You have been set free to live a righteous life because you have the very same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead living in you. So this idea of godly freedom, God's definition of freedom, 
is a freedom to live a truly righteous life by the Spirit of God. But finally, we've also been set free for. In Christ, we are free for kingdom fruitfulness. Look at some verses at the end of the, this chapter. This chapter doesn't flush this out fully, but Paul goes on in Romans chapter 12 to really show us a little bit more of what this means. But the end of verse 19 again says, for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. And then verse 22, but now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. And those two verses, there's a, there's a big $5 word in there, sanctification. And it's one of those, you know, biblical words that'll make you sound really smart. But really what it means is it's just a process of holy transformation. It's the process that God puts us into of holy transformation from the time that we are justified. Our condition is set free before God because of faith in Christ. And we are eternally his forever. We enter into this process of sanctification at that point. We're now for the rest of our natural lives here. God is going to have us in a process of holy transformation. He says the end of that process is to make you look like the perfect reflection of Jesus. And that will happen when we die. But from now until then, God's got us in this process. And sometimes when we see that word or we see words like it, we've been talking in the series about the waters we swim in, right? You know, sometimes we don't realize the degree to which we are swimming in just our American individualistic culture. And so we see a word like this and immediately... We're gonna say, oh, the process of holy transformation. That's about me and my personal character. That's about me and my personal you know, integrity and my personal purity and my personal holiness. And while it is not less than that, is it a thousand, it's a thousand times more than that. Because what is the process of holy transformation? We are called the body of Christ. And that's where Paul fleshes this out even more in Romans 12, where he says, you know what? There's one body, the body of Christ, everyone who's placed their faith in Jesus Christ. But there are unique members in it. And God has gifted every single member in it differently. And so as all of us are being sanctified, as all of us are going through this transformation process, we're being set free for a kingdom purpose, kingdom fruitfulness, Collectively, as we are going through this process of saying, you know what, I have personally placed my faith in Christ and I've been set free from the penalty of my sin in order that I may begin to live a freedom to a life of righteousness in order that I may be free for kingdom fruitfulness. So think about this again. Let's go back to the car example. This car has been released. It's been set free from its sand. It's now able to function. It's able to, to be free to you know, operate the way it was intended. But what good is it if it stays in the garage? It's a perfectly functioning vehicle. It may be of high value in the garage, but it is of no use to its purpose. See, a car's purpose is transportation to get people and things from one point to another point. If it never gets out of the garage, even if it has no sand in the gas tank and it runs perfectly... It is of no use to its purpose. I'm, I'm afraid that we have many, many Christians who are sitting in the garage. Oh, they have high value. God declared your value on the cross. That's how much you're worth. You have high value, but you're sitting in the garage. You may be able to function perfectly as God has designed you, but until you get out of the garage and you start fulfilling that purpose, you start living into the kingdom fruitfulness for which God made you, you are not going to experience the fullness of freedom that God has given you. See, in my own life, when I started my recovery, I had the same idea that every single guy who ever starts recovery is. The whole point is to stop doing all these terrible addictive behaviors. That's what I thought the goal was. Boy, was I wrong. I didn't realize that God wanted to do a complete transformation in my life that was actually meant for others. 
For God so loved the world, what? That he gave his only son. Was God's purpose simply to make us clean? Or what is it to actually make us like his son and like himself who just said, I'm a giver. My life is meant to be spent for others. My life is meant to go for others. And that's where we find the fullness of freedom. The effect of freedom for kingdom fruitfulness is that you discover your purpose. You discover how you have been uniquely made by God and gifted by his spirit to live out your life in this sanctifying process, not only for your good, but also for the good of others. That is what we were made for. So how can you have this freedom in Christ? You know, freedom in Christ, is, it's actually simple to receive because we've mentioned it. It's faith, right? Put your trust in Christ. But really to, to understand what, it, what its full implications are, that's worked out over a lifetime. I don't want anybody to get this idea that says, man, I just haven't gotten the formula right, or I haven't said the words right, or I haven't said the prayer right, that if I just get that right, boom, I have perfectly mature freedom in Christ. It doesn't really work like that. I think there's a reason why God oftentimes uses agricultural examples to show us what he's trying to do in our lives, right? When he tells us in Galatians that, you know, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, and self-control. Well, how does fruit start? It starts as a seed, right? So many times what God is doing in this, when he says that we, have, that we might too walk in newness of life, what he's done is he's, he's planted a seed in us. He's planted that seed of his spirit in us that says, first, your condition is absolutely clean before me. You are, you are free. You're free from the penalty and the guilt of your sin. But that seed is meant to grow in order that you would be free to live a righteous life, in order that the maturity of that seed might produce fruit that then blesses others. That is freedom for kingdom fruitfulness. There's three things that are key, I think, to really experiencing the fullness of this freedom that God has for us, as opposed to what the world is trying to tell us freedom is. And we must trust Christ, we must obey Christ, and we must share Christ. Trust Christ. We've already seen that in, in Romans chapter five, right? Verse one. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, John 3, 16, right? That tells us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. The world wants to say that freedom is all about trusting yourself. Your desires, your opinions are all that matters. But God says that freedom is found in trusting Christ. His perfect life and substitutionary sacrifice are the only means by which we can be forgiven of our sins and receive eternal life. So when we give up on our ability to save ourselves and trust in Christ alone for our salvation, we are forever released from the penalty of sin. So in Christ, we have peace with God. Do you want to be free? Trust Christ. You know, sometimes though, I think in our attempts to make sure that people understand that we are not saved by anything that we can do, that it is absolutely a gift of grace. Sometimes in our attempt to so clearly communicate that message, we miss out on what the implications of that gift of salvation are. And so we say nothing about obeying Christ. And we almost make it seem like, you know what? It's okay if you keep sinning. What have we just read today? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Paul is trying to get our attention here and say, don't cheapen the grace of God by saying, I can live any way I want. In fact, I would argue, as one who's been on a journey for the past 25 years in terms of my recovery and growth in that particular area of my life, I would argue that you can't really even understand the freedom you've been given until you really get serious about obeying Christ and saying my whole life, remember what this one, one verse said? That we give our whole selves surrender to God. Not one part that we say, I want to hold on to. 
I think it's only when we really do that that we start to understand the real gift of freedom that we have been given in Christ. See, the world says that freedom is, is a casting off of all restraints and laws. Boundaries are seen as an enemy of freedom and must be torn down. But God says freedom can only be experienced within the boundaries that he has established. And I will argue to, to you this morning, the tighter the boundary, the more powerful the life. Let me illustrate this. Let's say you go to your home this afternoon and you grab the water hose on the outside of your house and you turn the water on and the water starts flowing out of the hose. At that point, you're probably able to water your plants and, and maybe even get a little bit of dust off your car. But simply at that pressure, you are not going to be able to clean the stains off your driveway. What do you have to do? You can hook that same hose up to a pressure washer and what does that do? It restricts, it creates a tighter boundary around that water and then you can blast all that's on your driveway off. That is the picture of the powerful freedom that God wants to give you. He's saying, don't try to live close up to the boundaries that I've set. The deeper, the tighter, the more you will go into the boundaries, the more you'll experience a liberation from fear. You will experience a liberation from all those temptations. You will not have to say yes anymore to those temptations. You will experience more freedom the more you obey Christ. And the good news is, you don't have to do any of it in your strength. He's given you his very spirit, the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. That's resurrection power. That's power over death lives in you. So don't let the enemy or anyone else tell you that anything that you're struggling with cannot be overcome in Christ. But finally, we need to share Christ. In order to experience the freedom that we've been given, we need to share Christ. The world says freedom is all about self-focus. Make everything about yourself, your happiness, your wants and wishes, your life ahead of everyone else. But God says freedom is all about Christ's focus. Make everything about Jesus, his pleasure, his wants and wishes, his life above everything. When our eyes are fixed on Jesus, our lips can't help but tell others the good news. True freedom in Christ is never a blessing to be hoarded. It's a gift to be shared. So as we close here, I want to ask if, if you've been swimming in the world's definition of freedom and not even known it. You've been seeking to be whoever you say you want to be. You've been seeking to do whatever you want to do. You've been seeking to follow your heart and make your own. God is here, Christ is here, and he's inviting you to live in a new way, to live in the freedom that he offers in Jesus. So let's be reminded that God's freedom gives peace. In Christ, you are free from the penalty of sin and separation from God. God's freedom gives power. In Christ, you're actually free to live a righteous life. You can say no to sin, and you can say yes to a righteous life. And God's freedom gives purpose. In Christ, you are free for kingdom fruitfulness. So in whatever ways you find yourself trapped by the world's false definition of freedom, Christ can and will set you free, truly free today. After the service, we're going to have our prayer team up here. And I want anyone who this message has really pricked your heart, where you know the Holy Spirit is tapping on you right now and saying, it's that thing. It's that thing that needs to come to light today. I wanna to encourage you at the end of this service to come forward for prayer. But also we can help you take some next steps, especially if you're struggling with some kind of unwanted sexual behavior. That's what I've been doing for 20 plus years is helping people break free from those kinds of things. I'd love to talk with you and I'd love to help you take your next step. But I can think of no better way for us to end a message on freedom and freedom in Christ than by celebrating communion together. This was a, an act 
that Jesus himself instituted with his disciples in his last night with them. He took the bread and he broke it and he symbolized the way his body was gonna be ripped, his flesh was gonna be ripped. He took the cup, symbolizing the blood that was gonna be shed. He says, I want you every single time you eat this bread and you drink this cup, I want you to remember me. And that's what I want all of us to remember here today. Whatever we are struggling with, whatever strongholds, whatever besetting sins, it is only Christ that can set us free. And so I want to ask anyone here that is that has never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, what better time than right now, today, to trust in him? He's made a way for you to have reconciliation with the Father. He's made a way for you to be set free from not just the condition of your sin, but also the implications of it in your life right now. But if you are a believer and you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, but you're living more by the world's definition of freedom than by God's definition, then I invite you to repent. God is full of mercy and grace for, who, for his kids who come to him in confession and repentance. And this is an opportunity to do this before we take the elements. And make no bones about it. Living by the world's definition of freedom, it is sin, folks. It's idolatry. But again, God is full of grace and mercy. And so let's take a, take a moment now to prepare our hearts to share in this together. Confess any sin to God that you need to confess. Thank him for what he has done in your life how he has set you free and what he's doing to continue on that journey. Father, what can we say but thank you? Thank you for sending your son to be the perfect, spotless lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are obedient to the Father for our sake, that you bore our sin and our shame in your body, and that it was broken for you Lord, we thank you and we take this bread in remembrance of you. Lord, your word says that apart from the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sins. Lord, you were willing. You spilled out your blood in order to satisfy the righteous, just penalty for our sin before God. We thank you. We want to live in such a way that we honor that sacrifice. We remember you now as we take the drink together. Father, we do thank you. We thank you for your word that reminds us that you have a love for us that is everlasting. That reminds us that we were set free in Christ from our sin and that penalty, but you've also set us free, Lord, to live the righteous life that we can now have in Christ, to walk in newness of life in that resurrection power that you put in us by your spirit in order that we might be free for kingdom fruitfulness, Lord. You, Lord, are the one that taught us to pray to the Father. Your will be done. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Help us to be faithful representatives of your kingdom and your will on earth. We pray all this in Jesus' name.